Hello, I'm Robert. I'm helping you if you're scared of many things. And this is a, a viral, uh, something that is scaring a couple of members on, um, in our Doomsday Debunked group. And apparently uh, someone uh, was told by a kid that the, an asteroid the size of the moon is going to hit Earth. And the kid told them that they saw this on TikTok. And that's all we know about it. And the, uh, whatever you see on TikTok, it just a kid in the street could just go, into, go up to TikTok, upload a photo of the moon and upload a soundtrack and then um, voice over that and say, an asteroid the size of the moon is going to hit Earth. Any kid can do that anywhere. Any of the billions of the hundreds of millions of kids connected to the internet, it just needs one of them to go join TikTok and upload a video and there you are, there it is. It just means absolutely nothing that someone has uploaded a video to TikTok saying some utter nuts thing. We, we get loads and loads of utter garbage that gets uploaded to TikTok every day. So uh, we know all the asteroids, all the large asteroids in our solar system. This is the largest, which is Ceres, and Ceres is uh, much smaller than the Moon. And the uh, asteroid the largest asteroid to hit Earth in recent times, you would, only, you would hardly see it on this uh, infographic. It's only two pixels across, 10 kilometers. It's a tiny speck at the end of that arrow. I don't know if you'll be able to see this when I upload the video. And we know all the asteroids of that size also that pass close to Earth. And none of them can hit us for thousands of years. So it's absolutely impossible that an asteroid even as big as Ceres hits Earth. Indeed, it's impossible for one. This, this, uh, there have been no impacts. So we can look at the moon. You, you probably like there's an impact crater on the moon. So that was quite a large asteroid that hit the moon in the very distant past and formed that crater. And if we look at the, uh, there are two planets and the moon that have really excellent crater history. That's uh, Mercury and Mars, and their surface is not e even, nothing like continental drift and no weather uh, of, uh, e uh, that's uh, powerful enough to erode craters. And so they're very clear craters from the early solar system. And then the moon, of course. And ever since after the Mares form, which are these dark patches, after that, then there's been nothing really to erase craters. And there's, uh, uh, the, there are several big craters from the early solar system 3.8 billion years ago. And, but even these huge craters from long, long ago were uh, only a quarter of the size of the asteroid of Ceres, the impactor that formed these craters. And that is an immense time period ago. It took about half a billion years for humans to evolve from microscopic creatures, creatures in the sea that you could only see with a microscope. And that is enough time for that, happen, for that to happen seven times over. That's how long ago it was since the last impact crater of this size. More than seven times the length of time it took. So you'll go back to your parents, grandparents, back and back, 100 generations, 1,000 generations, back to when, uh, when we were little creatures scurrying at the foot of the dinosaurs, and then back and back to when we were in the sea as little microscopic creatures, and back and back and back and back. And you have to go all that, that way back for billions of years before you can see an impact this big in the in a solar system. And uh, we also know why this is. It's because the Earth and Moon and the, all the planets, they formed from planetary embryos. The solar system formed from the bottom up. Smaller things, and we can actually look at comets and they, when you look at the comet 67P, they looked at it and they saw these tiny um, uh, blobs that kind of stuck together. And they called them goosebumps for some reason. And they, um, they kind of little bumps that made up the surface. And these were the 
very small things that combine together to make the comet. And then larger things combine together to get bigger things and bigger things. It's now very clear that the planets formed not all in one go, but from the bottom up on smaller objects, uh, which we call planetary embryos once they get large. And the larger planetary embryos, uh, which we call embryos because they eventually turned into planets, were a size of uh, a larger planets when combined together, were a uh, size of Mercury, size of Mars, even the size of Venus. And uh, an ob object perhaps the size of Venus and one the size of Mars, they hit each other and formed the Earth and the Moon as a result of the collision. So all that happened in the first few hundred million years, over and over and over, and the, and the solar system was full of colliding things back then. And then there was what they call late heavy bombardment, and the tail end of it, it's late only com compared to the early solar system, it was a very long time ago for us. So that was when the last few of these objects were cleared up from the solar system. And that's this 3.8 billion years ago, when the remaining larger objects eventually all hit planets eventually, because they weren't in stable orbits and they could last in those orbits for uh, tens, hundreds of millions of years, but eventually they hit something, even if they're in quite good circular orbits. And then the only ones left were the big asteroids left in the asteroid belt. That was the only place where you could stay in a stable orbit for billions of years if you were a planetary embryo, embryo. And so the only ones we have left now are Ceres and Vesta and, and the other larger asteroids in the asteroid belt. And these are very easy to see with a modern telescope. We could have seen them with naked eye. They're faintly visible, but uh, nobody noticed them amongst all the faint stars. And they were first discovered in the 19th century. The moon is far larger than them. If there'd been an asteroid as big as the moon, it would have been known long ago, it would have been known by the ancients, and they'd be following it. And uh, they'd have said, well, well, there's this faint, very faint star that we see at certain times of the year, and that, that would be an, an asteroid the size of the moon. There, there isn't an asteroid the size of the moon, it can't be. And we also know this, even if you, uh, the, ast the moon is actually very dark, it's as dark as, as asphalt, and you, uh, as, the, as a worn surface of the road, it just looks bright in the, at night because there's nothing else around it. If you could put a, a, a dark robe up in the sky and have the sunlight shining on it, it would look as bright as the moon at night. So the moon, uh, as we saw when the, uh, the moon's surface is very dark and yet it is very easy to see. And then we also know at night because there isn't anything else there shining. And so it'd be very easy to see a moon side, even a very dark asteroid, no problem. And we would, uh, the ancients would have known about it. And long before telescopes. And uh, so, so there is no asteroid this big, it just can't be. We also know from the, uh, our spacecraft, and we can monitor how they move through space. And by monitoring the spacecraft when they get out of Saturn, which gives a very sensitive measurement, then we know for sure that the uh, the total of all the asteroids that we haven't that we haven't uh, managed to find yet are far less in mass than Ceres. All that mass combined together has to be much less than the mass of Ceres. All the unknown matter inside of Saturn's orbit. So we have a pretty good understanding of the solar system. And the solar system is stable for billions of years into the future. Now, the, uh, so, so after all those embryos were swept up, then we were left with a very stable solar system. But it's not totally 100% stable for billions of billions and billions of years. So I just want to explain this little point, that uh, it, uh, it most likely is. So you, uh, it's like with the weather, that you can't 
You can predict summer and winter, you can predict climate change, global warming. You can't predict an individual rain shower uh, two weeks in the future. And there's no way we will ever be able to do that. It's called uh, sensitive dependence on initial conditions. And it's because even if you knew the position of everything to the nearest, uh, all every single, uh, all the wind, all the air in the atmosphere, the temperatures of all the oceans, and even if you knew it very, very exactly, you still couldn't predict because it can go different ways. And it's just so sensitive to very, very tiny changes just now. That whole thing about a butterfly, it's not like a butterfly flapping its wings can't make a hurricane. It's not a, a connection like that from an individual but butterfly to a hurricane. But in order to predict a hurricane, uh, so, you know, some weeks in advance, you would need to know the positions of the wig flaps of all the butterflies in the world, and even that wouldn't be enough, along with everything else, against with all the water running into, you know, you would, and you need to continue to know that all the way f through into the future until, the, until um, not far before the hurricane started to form. <coughs> so that is, and even that wouldn't be enough if you go back far enough. So in that sense, the weather is just can't be predicted individual rain showers and even individual storms of a long time in the future, although we can predict things like warming and we can predict things like hurricanes, things like winter and summer um, in the far future. And so the solar system is like that too, but on a much longer time scale. The planets are in, we, we can predict that there's no problem with the planets for billions of years, the orbits, we know their orbits very well for at least about three billion years. But we don't know the position of the planets in their orbits uh, longer than tens or hundreds of millions of years in the future. So you're orbiting around, but the various things that can slightly change the, and we don't know the how the orbits keep changing to be sort of more elongated and more circular, and they they um, they they kind of precess a bit and things like that. And these things we can't predict exactly. Uh, it's over about tens to hundreds of millions of years. We just it's just like predicting a rain shower, we, an individual rain shower or hurricane. We simply can't say where it will be, and we will never be able to predict that, no matter how exactly. We measure the positions of all the planets in the solar system today. Nobody, even no matter how advanced our maths, we just don't have that level and we just can never achieve that level of uh, measurement of precision to be able to know where the planets will all be in their orbits and what shapes exactly all their orbits will be, say, you know, half a billion years from now. We're never going to know that. So uh, you, in order to look at the far future of the solar system, for very, very long time scales, they just do lots and lots of different runs, just like they do with the weather. When they say there's a 5% chance of rain on um, Friday week, say, what they do is they run the weather, the model of the weather, many times. And if five out of 100 runs end up with a rain shower, then they say there's a 5% chance of rain. And that's all you can ever do, no matter how good our uh, weather forecasting got. So, uh, depending, of course, now how sensitive your weather is, you know, if you're in a place which can have rain, and, and, and if the weather conditions are such that you could have rain at that point. So, in the same way, we uh, can't tell what position the planets will be uh, half a billion years from now in all their orbits, but we can do lots and lots of runs, and each one will end up half a billion years from now with the planets in different positions. And then we can say that you know, in one in a hundred we get this particular configuration and so on. So if we run this forward doing lots and lots of different runs and we run it forward for three billion years, then just a tiny fraction of a percent, most of the runs, nothing happens. But in a very, very small number of runs, a tiny, tiny fraction of a percent, then uh, Mercury and Jupiter's orbits decay and change in such a way that they end up in a resonance. Jupiter is the heaviest planet, Mercury is the lightest planet and closest to the Sun and most easy for Jupiter to nudge. And three billion years from now, there's a possibility that Jupiter can nudge Mercury. It's almost certain it won't do that. But in this remote possibility, then 
Mercury's orbit um, gets nudged in the same way each time, uh, over and over again, with them getting into the similar position relative to each other. And it gets longer and longer, it gets more and more stretched, until eventually Mercury's orbit crosses Venus's orbit. And then once that happens, then in elliptical orbits, Mercury's in an elliptical orbit, uh, Venus in a circular orbit, the elliptical orbit goes close to the Sun, then goes out past Venus, then closer again. And then uh, it could depend on the angles of the orbits, you know, where, where exactly Mercury is, where exactly Venus is. Then uh, it might be that it ends up with Mercury being deflected by Venus further out, or it might be that Mercury hits Venus. If Mercury hits Venus, then that's the end of it as far as we're concerned. If Mercury gets um, deflected further out, then it could hit Earth or it could miss Earth. And then if it hits us, then eventually, if it misses us, then over many uh, millions of years, eventually it could hit Mars. So there are quite a few different possibilities there. And uh, it's also possible, I think, that Mercury could be lost from the solar system altogether after many flybys of the planets. And uh, so in some of those scenarios in a very, very far future, the solar system's orbits, they all get jumbled up and the planets end up going different ways and things. And, uh, and in other uh, of those far future things, then it is possible for Mercury to hit Earth. So in most of them, almost all of them, this doesn't happen. So that's very far future. It can't happen today. And in that immensely far future, it's so far future that remember I talked about evolving all the way from microscopic creatures in seawater to us. Well, that could happen six times over in the future. So we could have a civilization by then, which is, uh, it could be that the microscopic creatures in the seawater right now, that half a billion years from now, will become part of our civilization. And then they'll be able to look back through their evolutionary history, and they'll be actually, maybe if our records for today survive, might be able to get photos of their ancestors. And they say, oh, look, this little microbe was us, or this little multicellular uh, organism from our time, from their seawater in that past civilization, that was us. So there might be a future civilization, and you know, who knows what they like, maybe they like, look like us, maybe they look like parrots or something, and these parrots, giant parrots, uh, parrots are very intelligent, some gray parrots, and these giant parrots would look in their microscope, and, and they'd look, and they'd have, uh, uh, images, photographs, GIFs, and JPEGs and PINGs from our time that have still been preserved in the digital record of the civilization. And they say, but look, that PING, that was us uh, way back then, half a billion years ago. And this could happen six times over before we get to this point where there's a possibility of something happening to Mercury. And, and uh, hopefully our civilization, well, I, I see no reason why our civilization is ever going to stop. It's become pretty much ineradicable. So probably human beings or our descendants are still there, along with other creatures that have gradually evolved and become part of our civilization, including some creatures that may, at present, their ancestors may be just uh, sea creatures that we look at with microscopes, or in the pond, or in the soil, or in the air. And in that far future, they may join us in our, our civilization. So we're going to have lots and lots of very bright minds with very different uh, evolutionary histories and lots of different ways of examining problems and we already know ways of moving planets and uh, we, 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 uh, we can figure out a way that we could move Mercury if we wanted to but it would be a mega mega project but we would need lots of rockets and making up things from and it would it would need really building in space and building things from things and building more things from more things. It would really need to be very highly automated to be very practical. But we, we do know a way of doing it. It's basically, if you can fly other things past Mercury over and over again, and you can get something in an orbit that takes it past Jupiter and past Mercury over and over again, then you can transfer some of the momentum of Jupiter to the momentum of Mercury to change its orbit. So you could do that the other way around to keep Mercury's orbit is um, circular, and that would be feasible to do. And surely, there are, and there are other ways involving the electromagnetic ways of doing it as well, and uh, uh, which would uh, likely be much easier, uh, if if you call that easy, which it isn't. But you know, not not as vastly difficult as as, as, as setting a big um, 
a big asteroid or comet or moon into an orbit between Jupiter and Mercury to change its orbit. <coughs> but so we're talking about the very far future there, where they may well, in that very, very remote possibility, which is not likely to happen at all, then whatever clever creatures there may be on Earth or in our solar system spread out and maybe in space settlements and throughout our solar system, then uh, it's, for th it's their problem for them to solve. And I think we can be pretty confident that as long as civilization does continue, that they will be able to solve that. And then further in the future, uh, then we protect Earth as the sun gradually, very gradually, it's uh, about a similar time scale, the sun starts getting a bit hot and we have to start to move Earth anyway, or shield it. So we would probably be moving Earth anyway, so we're already moving planets around in that far future. And, uh, or, or shielding it, or we may not even be living on Earth anymore. We may be living in space settlements all the way out to Pluto and beyond. Or there uh, could be numerous different possibilities in that far, far future. So uh, we could be living on the on Callisto or uh, Saturn's moon Titan or in, in, uh, in space settlements that are slowly orbiting for gravity, very, very slow orbit slowly spinning for artificial gravity and you wouldn't actually get dizzy because you you because you yourself are moving and the gravity is caused by the motion unlike a fairground it wouldn't be like a fairground because the gravity is caused by motion so it'd be a very different situation from uh, spinning around in a fairground and then they'd also they could use thin film mir mirrors to concentrate the sunlight to get as much warmth and as much cooling as they like or they could be using fusion power by then. We probably have fusion power later this century and just use that to convert ice into energy. And so in the far, far future, I'm, I'm sure our, our civilization is surely just going to last on and on and on in the far future as long as we want it to, to continue for. And uh, so so we uh, don't, you don't, um, please don't be scared about the far future either. And so I hope, anyway, hopefully now I've got a bit of context here and to understand that there's just some silly silly child probably or an adult who's, who's um, pranking someone or joke or, or someone who uh, knows absolutely nothing about astronomy and uh, is just using their imagination and probably gets I their ideas from Star Trek or Star Wars or from Doctor Who or something and uh, has never even uh, looked or an asteroid in a telescope or or, 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 or uh, you know, they've never looked they probably never looked at their planet they never um, probably tried to find an asteroid they pro probably never read read about them and um, they neither neither observational astronomers nor uh, people who know anything about the theory of astronomy if if, if it was, it was either of those they just couldn't say something like this it's just utter, utter garbage. So I hope this helps you to be a little bit less scared of and, and to try to remember. If you can manage to filter and say things like, is this source a reliable source? That's a very simple question. And if it is, then you can pay some attention to them. If it is not, just ignore them. If, it's, if there's something like this that you needed to know, there would be someone reliable would say it, not just some kid who saw it on TikTok. There would be someone who, who really knew about asteroids and knew about the moon and knew about the solar system would uh, tell this to you. And some, someone from uh, NASA or the, uh, uh, the minor planet, uh, the National Astronomical Union, minor planetary division, be, uh, someone like that that would tell you something like this and not some kid who, who, who saw it on TikTok. <laughs>